Hello ladies and gentlemen. This is the third of a series on normalizing the same data but using three different techniques. The first one we used what we call determinants. That is listing all the attributes and finding out how they are related to each other by finding out which determines which. It works and it is quite simple but it takes a lot of time. The second technique we used Use the data. It works quite nicely, for example, when you use a, a spreadsheet and you move parts of the data across the spreadsheet. This technique uses a grid and we're going to come across exactly the same kind of problems through the unnormalized form of the data. The first, then the second, then the third normal form. In other words, whichever way you do it, it raises the same problems which end up solved in the same way. So the first thing we'll do is we're going to draw our grid by copying all of the attributes to one side and there is our unnormalized data. And we can mark specific features in our data. Remove any derived attributes. This time there aren't any but anything that is worked out rather than saved in the database would be removed. And mark the repeating groups. That is, from course number to grade, we have got several courses for each single student. So our data is made up of a header in the first two columns, followed by a repeating group in the remaining five. Now we have our repeating groups marked and we know the original primary key that was suggested for our data because it was underlined. We're going to work out the first normal form. The rules for the first normal form is we need to separate the repeating groups. So header forms its group, repeating group forms the rest. But when we do this, we've lost the information that was hidden in the fact that these two things were put side by side, that the data for them was put side by side. So now we copy over the primary key of the header group as a foreign key in the repeating group. There is our first normal form. The header group is now on its own with its primary key the repeating group is on its own, has a primary key, which is a compound. The primary key of the header group, which is repeated, is a foreign key in the repeating group. And we're going to attack the second normal form. The aim of the second normal form is to identify part key dependencies. A part key dependency is what happens when you have a compound key in the group where there is a compound key, some data depends on only part of the key. A drawing makes that clearer. So I'm going to highlight the compound key for the bottom group. There, some of the data requires both attributes. Course requires only one of them because the course title only depends on the course. The teacher only depends on the course. The room only depends on the course. But the grade is the grade of this student on this course. And so it requires the compound key. So course number has a number of attributes that depend on it and forms its table. While the compound key, student number plus course number, and the attributes that depend on it, forms its own table. The top group here does not have a compound key and so there's no part key dependency because there are no parts of this primary key. What about foreign keys? Student number here is the primary key. It is repeated in this one and so it's the foreign key in this one like before. Course number here is the primary key. It's repeated in this one so it's a foreign key in this one. It's the primary key in one structure and a foreign key in the other one. 
Finally, we have what we call non-key dependencies. A non-key dependency is the sort of things that occurs here. The teacher's name determines the room. Let's step back through the slides to see our data. The teacher is the determinant for the room. What I mean is the room always depends on the same teacher. Same teacher, called Kemp, appearing three times, each time the same room. If the teacher is different, the room is different. So the room depends on the teacher. Apparently, it's a place where lecturers are cushy and students move from room to room to meet them. So the teacher's name determines the room according to the data sample that we have. There will be a table with teacher as the primary key and room as another attribute. What about a course number and course title? The course number determines the course title and the course number determines the teacher's name. So now we can see two structures a non-key dependency, that is an attribute that depends on something that is not the current primary key of this structure. Or sometimes people say a transitive dependency, a dependency that happens from course number to room through another attribute. Anyway, we can see there are two structures, there they are. Teacher's name appears in the top in the first table. It's the primary key in the second table, and so it's the foreign key in the other one. The other two remain the same. There is only one non-key attribute, and so there's no opportunity for any non-key dependencies there, so they don't change. No change, no change. Now we have four separate structures of four separate tables, that is about the students, the grade, the course, the teacher. It's the same tables as before, let's see the data, it's the same entity model as before. So the teacher is related to the course and the teacher's name is being used as a foreign key, many is at the foreign key and always. Each student gets multiple grades, each grade is for a single student. Student number is here, repeated here, foreign key, many. Same happens here, Co each course has got multiple grades of students that are on it. The course number is the foreign key, it's also the many end of the relationship. And there's our entity model we've arrived at the same result using each of the three different techniques. Each of those techniques is valid and each of them has given us the same thing in the end. Which technique you should be using? It depends on how in control you feel with these different things. Some people very much like the grid because the grid is giving them a systematic approach to things where you always know what to do once you have practiced it a little. In other courses I have been to, some students like determinants better and find them easier. It's also a question of numbers. If you have too many attributes and they don't fit on a single sheet of A4, then you have too many attributes to work out the normalization through a determinants diagram. So that is it. I hope having the three techniques side by side helps you understand each one of them. I hope you're having a good start to the new year.